I will walk with you 
I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Well, good morning to you all and a very warm welcome to our morning service here at Obia Baptist Church. It's great to be able to welcome you all this morning, uh, whether you're a regular attender or if this is uh, your first time with us. Uh, our minister, Tom Cox, is on his last day of annual leave, so uh, it falls to me, uh, Paul Neville, again, to uh, to host this morning and no need to adjust your sets for those of you that are regulars i've moved the webcam it's nothing else more sinister than that um if uh, a couple of things just to to highlight as normal first of all um it's great to know who's out there and uh, to share uh, a welcome or a word with us. So do use the, the question and answer facility um, on the uh, uh, Teams. Um, just click on the speech bubble with a question mark inside. And whilst it says ask a question, you don't need to ask a question. You can just say hello. Uh, it's good to, to know that, that folks are out there. Um, and uh, when certainly when you're leading uh, the service or uh, preaching, 
it, it can sometimes be difficult just talking to a camera. So knowing that people are out there really helps. So do say hello using that facility. Um, also, uh, if you have any form of, of hearing difficulties and would find subtitles helpful, then a reminder, uh, particularly if you're using a laptop or a desktop computer, to click on the gear icon in the bottom right hand corner, as you can see on the screen at the moment, and change the caption settings from off to English. Uh, we can't guarantee the accuracy of them, but hopefully that will, will help. Um, in terms of rest of the news this morning, um, a exciting uh, development today, if you like, uh, is that we've restarted Children's Church and the Sunday morning group this morning. So uh, they've been meeting on Zoom um, from uh, 10 o'clock this morning till about 20 past and uh, Hopefully Luke sent out the details to those that would like to be involved in that going forward. But if anybody hasn't had the link to that, that uh, have got young people that want to be involved in those sessions going forward, then do get in contact with Luke Wigston uh, or indeed myself and I can forward that on. Uh, in terms of the use of the church, um, there's no particular update uh, this week in terms of using the uh, the building, but we have got both a church operations team and a leadership team meeting this week where we're going to review the next steps and we hope to have more news to share with you as a result of those meetings in terms of our future plans and how we can start on a phased basis reusing the buildings. Uh, a reminder in the meantime that if you're able to offer your services as a COVID steward, something that Tom mentioned in his um, earlier email and video, then please let us know ideally um, today or tomorrow because that's going to help us in our thinking and planning for how we can uh, move forward with that. And, and do let me know if you've got any questions, concerns, comments in that regard. Um, a reminder this afternoon that we'll be holding our monthly afternoon communion service at 4.30 and that's going to be led by uh, Martin and Paula Jones. Uh, the service is going to be available on YouTube and the link to how to join that was sent out with the email uh, for this morning's service. But let me know if you haven't received that and I can forward it on or just type in Oadby Baptist Church into YouTube and that should find itself. You find your way there. Uh, and also with the communion service, a reminder to have uh, the communion elements of bread and wine if you'd like to participate in that way. Um, also, in a couple of weeks time, um, we're going to be holding our September uh, church members meeting, uh, which like the June meeting we're going to hold using Zoom. We'll send out further details and agendas nearer the time. But for now, if you can make a note of the day, uh, Wednesday the 23rd of September at 7.30. Uh, refreshments, we're going to have our usual refreshments this morning after the service. So again, we'll be using Zoom for that uh, and Luke will again be hosting us for that uh, today. And so to our time of, of worship this morning, and as usual, there's a number of folk uh, that are joining together to lead us. So we're just going to check in with them, uh, making sure that the technology is working and giving them an opportunity to offer their welcome. So first of all, uh, to Rob Mason. Rob is going to be leading our, our song worship this morning. Good morning, Rob. Morning, Paul. Good morning, everybody. Have you got your usual? Uh, backing entourage today? Yes, I have. There's uh, Gillian, Jane and Leanne uh, in the background helping me out. Excellent. So we look forward to uh, to Rob leading us later. Um, we've got Chris Swan and Chris will be uh, preaching later, later in our service. Good morning, Chris. Morning, Paul. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Yes, yes. And finally, we have Jan Carter who will be leading our service. Good morning, Jan. Uh, morning, Paul. Morning, everyone. Yep. And uh, so with that, we're going to stay with Jan, um, who is going to lead us into our time of worship this morning. Thank you, Jan. Okay. Well, wherever you are today, uh, we give you a very warm welcome. As we gather, we're going to be using a Psalm 100 as our call to worship. 
many of you will know these words already. Some of you will have even sung them to the tune, the old 100, uh, all people that on earth do dwell. But we're going to use them this morning and let's hear them afresh as we come to worship. A psalm for giving grateful praise. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord, the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. I imagine that the psalmist had the temple in Jerusalem in mind when these words were penned. Uh, this is the model of the second temple that sat on that particular site in Jerusalem. Do you see the entrance into the temple through the gate in the wall and the courtyards beyond? Well, some of us perhaps are ready to enter the gates. Words of thanks already on our lips and praise bubbling up in our hearts. Some of us hold back with heavy hearts. Shout for joy. Worship with gladness. Come with joyful songs. That's just not me right now. Sometimes it really is a sacrifice to offer praise. We may not feel like it. We're struggling. We're weary. We feel let down. Painful life blows and losses have sent us spiralling downwards and there are broken pieces all around. At all times, but perhaps more so in times of difficulty, we need to be reminded of what is true. Regardless of how we feel and what seems to be happening around us, the Lord is eternal. The Lord is good. His loving kindness and his faithfulness to each and every one of us will endure forever. Our loving Heavenly Father invites us to draw near. He welcomes us with arms wide open. So come, let's enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with our sacrifice of praise as we pray together now. God of all blessings, source of all life and giver of all grace, we thank you for the mystery of creation, for the beauty that the eye can see, for the joy that the ear may hear, for the unknown that we cannot comprehend, filling the universe with wonder, for the expanse of space that draws us beyond the definitions of ourselves. We thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains life, for the food of this earth that nurtures life, for the love of family and friends that enrich life. We thank you for setting us in communities, for families who nurture our becoming, for children who lighten our moments with delight, for friends who love us by choice, for companions who share our burdens and daily tasks, for neighbours near and far, for people to love and by whom be loved, for strangers who welcome us into their midst, for people from other lands who call us to grow in our understanding. We thank you for this day, for life and one more day to love, for opportunity and one more day to work for justice and peace, for your grace and one more experience of your presence and for your promise to be with us and to be our God. We give you thanks and bring our sacrifice of praise, eternal loving God, through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. For all your goodness I will keep on singing 
10,000 reasons for my heart to find as we sing, bless the Lord, O my soul.
shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. Who, oh Lord, could save themselves? Their own soul could heal. A shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace is deeper still. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. Let us out of death. You alone belong to the highest praise. You, oh Lord, have made a way the great divide you heal. For when our hearts were far away, your love went further still. Lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. You alone belong to the highest praise. You alone belong to the highest praise. You alone belong to the highest Well, in case you hadn't guessed it, we're continuing our series in the book of Jonah this morning. Last week, we heard how God asked his prophet Jonah to go to Nineveh and speak to them about their wickedness. But Jonah ran away in the opposite direction. In the midst of a raging storm, Jonah is thrown overboard and left to drown. Uh, not sure what you're looking at on the screen, but shall I just carry on? Oh, um, we pray that God will open our ears and prepare our hearts to hear His voice this morning. David's going to read the next chapter from the Book of Jonah for us. 
and Chris is then going to share her thoughts and reflections on the passage of scripture. Jonah's prayer. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah, Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down, the earth beneath me barred me in forever. But you, Lord God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Over to Chris. Morning everyone. Uh, my talk today is going to be split into two shorter parts, um, both of which have a focus on Jonah. So uh, a longer part to start with and then a very short part to finish with. I wonder what stories you could tell about your childhood and the naughty things you did, or the things you didn't do but you got punished for anyway. At my infant school, the entrances to the indoor boys and girls toilets were opposite each other. Coming out of the toilets one day with my friend, she was grabbed by a bunch of <coughs> naughty boys who decided it would be a great lunchtime game to pull an unsuspecting girl into the boys' toilets as a guaranteed way of bringing on some screaming. I grabbed my friend's arm to try to pull her back, but just then the teacher walked by. The crowd of boys pulled her really hard. She shot through the doorway with me in her wake and the teacher in, acted instantly and made a judgment about what was happening. In her eyes, I was helping the boys by pushing my friend. And so I spent a very miserable lunchtime standing at the edge of the hall at the age of six, on the verge of tears that were part of necessary shame and part righteous anger at being punished for something that I didn't do. The teacher judged that I'd done something wrong and the punishment was time out to think about how naughty I'd been in the hope I'd mend my ways and learn to be good. As humans, we seem to have an inbuilt sense of justice and injustice. We learn when we're really small that doing something wrong deliberately has consequences. It either has time out or having to make amends or having to say sorry. And if we grow up in a family with siblings, we often have a keen eye on who's getting away with what and whether the right punishments are being enacted for not washing up when it's their turn. For, not take, for taking something that doesn't belong to them, or for being spiteful. Like children on an imaginary seesaw, somehow when they go down in everyone's estimation, we go up. The joy of being the one in the right and the pain of being the one whose faults are discovered are very real. Some of us like rules and are naturally conforming and can be, can be prone to being judgmental of others and even more so of ourselves. Others happily flout the rules, feeling they apply to everyone else but not to us, or that they're unnecessary for anyone. One of the things lockdown has taught us is that some of us follow the letter of the law, some flout the law, and some try to understand the spirit of the law and apply it in ways that make sense to us, because the letter of the law at the moment seems to contradict itself in too many ways. There have been times in the past few months when I've understood more deeply some of how it may have felt to have lived in Eastern Europe under the Stasi where neighbours watch each other to look for who might break the rules. It's just that these days the way of controlling another is through self-righteous comments on social media. So the story of Jonah has many layers and over the next few weeks we're looking at sections of it and pulling out different themes. Today we're looking at justice and grace 
justice and mercy. And I'd like to capture these with two images, a pair of justice scales in which wrongdoing might be weighed and the hug of a prodigal's father, unconditional and all encompassing, the grace of God. Grace is the undeserved goodness of God when God lavishes on us love and forgiveness we don't deserve. Like a student who never studied for their A-levels and got an A-star, a person who eats only donuts and crisps, but has a healthy weight and lives till 100, a murderer being pardoned or a prodigal welcomed home. There's a thread that runs through the story of Jonah that says who's in the right and who's in the wrong and what punishment do they deserve? So let's start with a map and some background to the story. As a church, we come from a wide range of theologies and some of us will see this as a story that sets out a historic event, while others will see it as a parable, a story with a meaning helping us to understand more about God and about our relationship with him. Either way, at the beginning of the story, Jonah is in Israel. The Assyrian Empire, with Nineveh near modern Mosul as its capital, is vast and powerful. It's renowned in Israel for evil, torture, dismemberment, the pain and shame of its victims. Archaeological excavation has discovered palaces and libraries and superb works of art, but the Israelites hated the Assyrians with a vengeance. The whole book of Nahum prophesies against them. You who has not, who has not felt your endless cruelty. They were the bully boys of the region in the eyes of the Israelites, strong, aggressive, taking what wasn't theirs. If their sins were weighed on the scales of justice, they'd definitely be found wanting and would deserve to be punished. So when God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me, Jonah refuses. As Andy said last week, that might be one of the reasons might be that he wants to stay in control and not be bossed around by God. One of the commentators likens the Assyrians to ISIS. So maybe another reason was that it meant going to the heart of the empire and telling them that God says they're doing a wicked thing and they need to stop. For Jonah, this probably feels a bit too much like giving them a warning when they really should be shut down in flames without any chance of change. And the chances of coming out alive are minimal. So instead of walking the 10 days to Nineveh, he takes a day's walk to Joppa and from there sails west, doing the absolute opposite of what God asks. You wonder what he's thinking at this point. Is he weighing up the risk of disobeying against the risk of going into the heart of the evil empire? It becomes clear through the story that his instincts are on the side of justice. So is he awaiting punishment on himself for turning his back on God and walking the other way? Catching a boat to Tarshish, he dis his disobedience doesn't go unnoticed. The storm brews up and is so fierce that everyone is threatened with drowning. The sailors pray to their gods and more than Jonah himself, they recognise that Jonah's God may be in control. They wake him up from sleeping soundly in the belly of the ship to get him to pray to his God for help. And in a time when disasters were often seen to be caused by someone doing something wrong, the sailors draw lots to identify who's at fault and Jonah is found out. Sticking with his clear sense of justice, Jonah recognises that he should take the consequences of his wrongdoing and offer to be thrown overboard. But the sailors are full of mercy and compassion. Despite the fact they've already lost all their cargo overboard as a result of Jonah's disobedience and probably their livelihoods going forwards, they still try to save him by rowing back to shore. But when that's not successful, they accept Jonah's offer, beg God's forgiveness for killing him and toss him into the sea. Where Jonah has ignored God, they recognise the supremacy of God and bow to him. What Jonah deserves, they all agree, is death. And so he sinks into the very depths in the middle of the ocean. The scales of justice have passed judgment and the punishment has been meted out. And so Jonah waits for death to envelop him. But as Psalm 139 says, where can I flee from your presence? If I make my bed in the depths, you were there. If I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the dark will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. And so there's a but. God sends a fish. 
that in the King James Version of the Bible, for some reason, is called a whale, and this sticks forever after, and it swallows Jonah whole, and Jonah is saved. By God's grace, he doesn't get what he deserves, he gets life, he gets a second chance. There is a consequence. God arranges time out for him, three days to think about the fact he's been rescued, to reflect on the fact he's deserved to die, but he's alive still. Like the prodigal son in the pigsty, he reaches rock bottom and comes face to face with the awfulness of what he's done. When I think about Islam, the biggest difference between my faith and that of my Muslim friends is the Christian notion of grace. In Islam, there's the belief that in death we go to be judged by God, who weighs our good deeds against our bad deeds on the scale of justice. More good deeds and we go to heaven, more bad deeds and we're punished in hell. But at the heart of the story of Jonah is an alternative understanding which predates the life of Jesus, but it is still full of New Testament understandings of God. That grace can triumph over justice, that out of his great love for us, no matter how dreadful things are that we do or have done in the past, grace, the undeserved goodness of God, can set us free and restore our relationship with our loving father who welcomes us home like the prodigal father and envelops us in the greatest hug. In the book of Hosea, God says, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, but the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by, my, by their arms, and I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like one who lifts a little child to their cheek and I bent down to feed them. So how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hold, how, how can I hand you over, Israel? My heart is changed within me. My compassion is aroused. God's love for Jonah overcomes his need for justice. Grace and mercy triumph. And so face to face with all that's gone wrong, and with the awe and wonder of God's grace, Jonah says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realms of the dead, I called for help and he listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas and the current swirled over me. All your waves and breakers swept over me and I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head to the roots of the mountains I sat down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. With shouts of grateful praise, I will sacrifice to you. What I have found, I will make good. I will say, Salvation comes from the Lord. And Jonah is indeed born again out of the belly of the fish as it burps him up onto the beach, ready to start again, finally obey God and head for Nineveh. We're often our worst, own worst critics. I wonder what you feel you might have done in your life that deserves justice. For some of those who've been Christians for years, there might be a sense of having heard enough sermons on repentance, turning around, that we've dug out all the worst and biggest sins of the past and brought them before God and known great grace and great forgiveness. So there's much to be thankful for and an ongoing day in, day out need to ask forgiveness for the ordinary sins of life, which somehow seem more visible as faith deepens and matures. For others, there may be things we've done which we can't face to bring into the light out of fear or shame that become a barrier between us and God, between us and others because if they knew, how much might they reject us? And for some of us, there will be great injustices that have been done against us, seemingly unforgivable sins committed by people who seem to have got away with it all, leaving us damaged and in pain while they walk away free. We so need to be forgiven, to forgive, and for grace to triumph over justice in our lives. I'm going to hand back to Jan now, who will lead us in some reflections on the theme of forgiveness. Earlier in the service, we sang, 
Who, O oh Lord, could save themselves? Their own souls could heal. Our shame was deeper than the sea. Your grace goes deeper still. And in the belly of the fish, these might have been Jonah's words. And King David wrote Psalms with this same central theme. Psalm 51 was written after he had sinned in murder, in adultery, in covering up the sin and in resisting the need for repentance. It had taken the bold confrontation of Nathan the prophet to shake David to the core before he comes in great honesty and brokenness before God. But Psalm 103 was also written by David, perhaps later in life, as he comes to understand the preciousness of pardon and the extent of God's unfailing love. So as we enter a time of confession, we're going to use verses from both of these Psalms. David will join me by reading verses from Psalm 51 and I will read from Psalm 103. But first, I invite us to bring our tired souls, our fickle hearts and our dirty hands to God in a moment of quiet reflection and confession. A litany of confession. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Our God is merciful and gracious, slow to get angry and full of unfailing love. Wash me clean from my guilt, purify me from my sin, for I recognise my shameful deeds. They haunt me day and night. God will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say and your judgment against me is just. God has not punished us for all our sins, nor does he deal us with us as we deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I was born a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. God is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he understands how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. You desire honesty from the heart. Teach me to be wise in my inmost being. For our days on earth are like grass. Like wild flowers we bloom and die. The wind blows and we are gone. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. For the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting for those who reverence him, his salvation to children's children, for those who are faithful to his covenant and remember to obey him. The sacrifice you want is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart O oh God, you will not despise. How God is merciful and gracious, slow to get angry and full of unfailing love. Amen. In prayer, we're going to continue now with the song, Lord, you see me through your mercy. I am guilty, still you love me. Here, where truth and mercy meet. And afterwards, we're going to listen to a song that is based on Jonah's prayer.
You'd expect Jonah to be the picture of forgiveness coming out of the fish. But as we'll see in the next stage of the story, he's not as forgiving to the Ninevites as God has been to him. We all have it in us to be like that. Jesus is so often seen challenging the Pharisees who set religious rules and held themselves and everyone else to account without grace or mercy, becoming hypocrites as they pretended to be more than they really were. In the story of the prodigal son, it's the older brother who is full of justice, lacking in grace, who wants his brother to receive the punishment he deserves, while he, the good brother, who stayed at home and stuck to the rules, gets the reward. But in this topsy-turvy world, God offers grace to all of us. And that's one of the great messages at the heart of the gospel that so many people in our families and our friendship groups and communities long to hear. The slate can be wiped clean. There is a second chance. We can be born again. Sadly, the church is best known by many in society in the likeness of a Pharisee or the older brother, judging, condemning, trying to impose its own rules and regulations on society. How many family members lose sight of God because they see him personified in Christian parents or siblings who are disappointed with them judgmental of them, rejecting of them. D.L. Moody said, of a hundred men, one will read the Bible, 99 will read the Christian. In the book, Sowing, Reaping, Keeping, Lawrence Singlehurst says, our first task 
is to help the community to see that God is good and Christians are okay. To break down the walls that have been built by Christians in the past who've been judgmental, clumsy, unkind and ungracious. We have really good news to share, a life set free, grace beyond measure. The love of a father who welcomes us home, a second chance. May we embrace it fully and then pass it on to those hungry for forgiveness and a slate wiped clean. Amen. And now I'll hand back to Jan. As part of our reflection, we're going to use an image that I think it's Chris that has used in the past with her link with Japan and Pete when he was out there. Kintsugi is the, I'm sure that's probably not pronounced correctly, but that's what we'll go with, is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage with lacquer, dusted or mixed with powdered gold or silver or platinum. By repairing the brokenness in a way that doesn't hide the scars, the pot has beauty and definitely a new lease of life. What a lovely image of the restoring grace of God. Rescuing broken pieces, hunting for every little last one. Healing scars, restoring lives to new beauty and purpose. The good news of God's grace is for us perhaps something that Jonah came to realise in the belly of the fish. But it's not just for us. God's grace is freely available for everyone, something Jonah had to learn in relation to Nineveh. The God of rescue and restoration wants to shine the light of his love and his redeeming grace into the lives of all. Paul, writing to the Christians in Corinth, put it like this. We have the light of Christ shining in our heart, hearts, for we ourselves are like fragile jars of clay containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that the great power belongs to God and doesn't come from us. Where do we need God's redeeming grace in our lives? Perhaps your prayer today is, dear God, pick up the broken pieces of my life. Please put me back together again. Wouldn't you love him to use some of that lacquer and the gold and the silver and the platinum to put you back together again? Where does God want us to shine his light? Perhaps your prayer is that God's light will shine through the redeemed scars of your life. That others will come to know of God's unconditional love and his all encompassing forgiveness. And while that last image remains on the screen for us, we're going to have a moment of quiet again as we bring our individual prayers to God in response to all that we've heard from Chris as she shared on the story of Jonah. For what we've sung this morning that perhaps has touched your heart. Or for these thoughts and reflections on how we might respond to the story of Jonah. Let's pray. In a moment, Rob is going to lead us in two songs of response. Um, but if anything this morning has touched your heart, perhaps you feel challenged by what has been said and you'd like someone to pray with you, don't forget to um, respond to the email, the prayer request one, or contact anybody within church that you know, or the leadership team, and people are more than happy to pray with you over any of the issues that perhaps have been raised this morning. So we pray, Jesus, be the centre.
great defender, strong in love, forever faithful. We are yours, and we will trust in you. You are God, a great defender, strong in love, forever faithful. We are yours. Well, thank you uh, for all those who've uh, contributed to our service this morning. Uh, much to to think about and reflect on uh, in terms of God's justice and grace. And as, as Jan has just said, um, I just encourage you, if there is something that you want to talk through, to pray through, uh, that's come about from this morning's service, then, then please do reach out to uh, to somebody, whether that be family, friends, or a member of your home group, or use the uh, prayers at um, Obi Baptist Church uh, email that will be on the screen at the end of the service. Um, so thanks uh, to uh, Jan for leading us. Thank you to to Chris for sharing uh, God's word and for Rob for leading us in song worship. And uh, last but not least to Tim and Ellen for all the behind the scenes work in making sure that videos play, words appear, etc. on the screen. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. So thank you for that. So before we, we close, let me finish with uh, a prayer of blessing. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.